Good morning in New York. Good evening in Armenia, the Republic of Atzach, Europe and Israel. Good morning in Los Angeles and welcome whatever time of day or night it is for those joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining us. Today's International Center for Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma webinar is held in advance of 24 April, the day commemorating the Armenian genocide by the Ottoman Empire during World War I, the first non-colonial genocide of the 20th century that began Saturday, 24 April, 1915. Launching the documentary, The Desire to Live, Webinar participants will discuss the making and implications of the film and the multi-generational struggles to seek acknowledgement and justice for both victims and descendants of the Armenian genocide and of the war in the Republic of Atzach and their interrelated legacies. Alas, Today's confluence of threats near and far challenge us, challenges us almost daily to yet again resiliently or just stubbornly hold the promise of never again, of repairing and renewing lives without giving in to despair. Your moderator, is a clinical psychologist, victimologist, and traumatologist who has devoted much of her my time to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights and to reparative justice. Our first presenter, Mariam Avetisian, is an independent filmmaker born and living in Atzach. Mariam wrote, directed, and edited the no commentary style documentary feature film that many of you have already seen in a web series to show post-war life in Atzach, both named The Desire to Live. As you know, the film conveys the legacies of the 20, 2020 war on the indigenous population of Artsakh and how their lives have been threatened and affected but by both the Azerbaijani forces and by experiencing the recent war as a continuation of the 1915 genocide and its aftermath. Our second presenter and interpreter is Peter Bahlawanyan, a produ producer director with over 30 years of experience in almost every aspect of entertainment industry. Peter is a grandchild of orphans of the Armenian genocide and an active force in protecting the Armenian culture through music, art, and film. Our third presenter is Gayane Kechumyan, an attorney licensed in California and Illinois who has specialized in international law and investigations into civil rights violations. She has counseled foreign entities and litigated in United States federal courts on behalf of victims of the Armenian genocide and the war in the Republic of Atzach. Gayane previously served as a visiting professional at the International Criminal Court in The Hague and clerked, clerked at the United Nations Criminal Tribunal prosecuting genocide and crimes against humanity in Cambodia. We have about an hour and a quarter for the webinar, although we have been known to run over time. Each speaker will talk for about 12 minutes 
Following a brief interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words, and I will conclude by announcing our future webinars. Please use the chat function for comments only and the Q&A function for questions. And we'll do our best to respond to as many of them as we can. Feel free to direct your questions to a particular panelist or to the full panel. I give the screen floor <laughs> to Marianne Avestisian. Marianne. Thank you. Nikich Kupatmem in Masin, Yestin Velem Artsahum, U San Vestari April, Uapme Martsahum, Yer Pek Patiras in Che de Sel, in Chef Yerquazar Xant Bacana, by Chatel Sel, Rofetev, Inchbeski Teng Chatera Artsaha, Voch Ankar Petitune, Haikakan Petitun, Uni Shat Harus Patmutun. U Arten Miankam Patras Metesel, by Tsavok, Yerquazar Sant Vakani Septemberin, Noritz Patras Tesang, U Esankam Yesel Akanates, Yera Ait Paterasmi. I'll I'll translate now. So yeah. So Mariam is a uh, Artsakh native, born and raised, 26 years, and basically lived her whole life, her entire life there. She uh, had not really seen anything uh, like major conflicts until uh, this very recent war. Obviously, there was a four-day war in 2016, but it was nothing compared to what happened in 2020. Uh, basically, has studied film, um, at least journalism, uh, to be exact. And uh, she's dedicated pretty much her life now to uh, finding justice there in Artsakh. And inch Katarvet Yerquazar Sant Bakanin, Amboch Chayutan Hamar, who had Capes Artsahum Apro Martkan Samar, Shat Ahavor, Ushad Dervajaman Akneren, who Yerquazar Sant Bakanis Mincher Esor Dershar Nakumen, who at Patrasmin Tatskum, yes, Voroshelem, or inch Karuham Anem Artsahi Hamar. Usk seti nekara hanel dokumental film vor pezi ambogh jash karin tuitstam te inche katar vom artsakhum inch trauma nerov inch tushvarutun nerov vait nev inch kan yerazank nerov en abrum artsakhti nera. The her focus right now is the people of Artsakh and what's happening there day to day. If the events that have taken them 2020, the 44 day war has left a major impact in how they live, uh, the trauma they in encountered on a daily basis, and the fact that they're in jeopardy right now, presently. The people there are basically, you know, habitants of that land, and their desire to live, as the title of her film, is really their, uh, their right to live there. You know, this is, this is the fight now, and they, they she has focused uh, all her time and energy into documenting, archiving, and spreading, showing the world what is going on in that region. Shad intervenerem arel artsakhtineri het u amenahetakrkire ener for bolor artsakhtinere bolor ofker aprumen artsakhum unen menakmi tsangutun. Vor Sharunaken, April Artsakhum, Vor I Levas Pateras Michelini, Mishtha Gutsundini, Uvor Ashara Tesni Artsaha Ujanachi, Artsahi Angartsuna, Profitev Dranov, Gutse Mikich, Aderbejan, Chi Sharunagelu, Ir, Teraspan Gortsunera, Chi Kandalu, Vochmer Mashakuita, Vochmer Yakaratinera, Yev Kutse et Jamanak Kutse Yerp Amorchash Harjanachi Artsaha et Jamanak Meng Karo and Feda Kangner makes Tarat Kain Amorchakansu. The fight there continues further than just the war of 44 days. It's the, the cultural destruction that Azerbaijan has put into their 
um, agenda. And this, this destruction has been going on for some time now. I mean, the destruction of churches, artifacts, historical monuments, and just basically anything to do with Armenian history. They're trying to wipe out everything about Armenians in that area, every which way possible. And the people of Artsakh, all they're trying to do is live and live their lives, trying to create a secure environment, a safe environment for their children, grandchildren, hundreds of years that they've been living on those lands. All, all their concerns are now is how are they going to live in peace without the threat of Azerbaijan attacking them or taking away you know, their children, the fear of something happening overnight. This is the case now there. And the people there, they, have, they don't know what, how to survive because obviously they don't have strong armies. Uh, the population there are not, uh, they don't have weapons. And this is the key here. We have to figure out how we're going to be able to help the people of Aksan. Մարդիկ նաև պատերազմից տո մինչև այսօր ունեն շատ մեծ տրամաներ, շատ վախեր, եթե որինակ ես էլ ինք սականատես եմ եղել, երբ որինակ կաղաքում Fireworks հրավարություն է եղել, մարդիկ մի անգամից շատ վախեցել են, որովտև իրանք այդ ձայնից հիշում են, թե ինչպես 2020 թվականին ադրբեջանը հրետակոցում էր Ստեպանակի արդը և արցախի մնացած կաղաքներ ու գյուղերը։ Ու այդ տրամաներով մարդիկ ապրում են ու նաև երեխանները, ովքեր բարձր ծայներից պետք է լկեն իրանց տունը ու գուծ է չեն կարող վերադարնան, ինչպես եղել է շատ արցաղցինների հետ, ովքեր մինչև էսօր ապրում են ուրիշտեղ ու չեն կարող վերադարնան իրենց տունը, թե շուշիում, թե հադրութում, թե տարբեր գյուղերու all she, she's encountered throughout the time are people with living with trauma, day-to-day -day trauma, that because she's been in situations where she's documented um, stories and uh, their lives. And while, the, while she's filming, you know, gunfire has occurred. And the minute the gunfire has occurred, the trauma of the war affects them immediately. And you, know, you see it in the films and, and the recordings that she's made that the automatically people's behavior changes, the, the way they react change, just by hearing you know, gunshots or gunfire on the, on the outside. Now, the Azerbaijanis are very close to Artsakh right now. And a lot of the towns, they're, they're literally meters, meters away. When I say meters, it could be a couple of hundred meters away where, and they have a higher point where they're always available to attack. And that fear is there in the people, a day-to-day -day fear that they have to live with and with the fact that they have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow but yet they're still there you know in the lands not leaving because that is their home and that's all they know as their home um mi kan ishabat araj nkara epizod enk arel mi gyughum vori et harevan gyugha adarbejantsnera mi amis araj okupatsrelen ու այդ գյուղի բնակիչները դրապրում են իրենց գյուղում, բայց շատ վախով, որ երևի հաջորդ գյուղը իրանցը կլինի ու ինչկան են այդ ժամանակ, որ պատերազմ վերջացել է, բայց ադրբեջանը չի կանգնում ու շարունակում է գյուղ արգյուղ, կաղակ արգ, կաղակ մարդկանց վախեցնել ու ուզումա ոգուպացնի իրանց տարածքը։ Ու նաև տարբեր բարձրախոսերով դիմումա արցախի բնակիչներին, որ պետք է լկեք այդ գյուղերը, այդ տարածքը, որով տեվ այդ ադրբեջանինն է, բայց մարդիկ չգիտեն ինչ անեն, ամեն որ ապրում են վախով, չմանալով ինչ կլինի հետագայում ո ինչ որ բանով ոգնի։ 
just last month that basically uh, when she was filming, the uh, people of Atsakh, the people that are living in that town, that town what was already taken by Azerbaijan uh, for a period of time and then taken back by Artsakh people. And now they're living there, but yet there's insurance that the fact that they don't know when they're going to come back. What Artsakh is basically uh, a small towns all over the area, about mountainous region. And each region, each little town, it's got its own charm. And it, the population there have been there for centuries. So now they're worried that town by town, the Azerbaijani government and the military, they basically can attack and grab it. And that's their goal. They, they've even announced it on loudspeakers, this form of terrorizing the population. You know, they would tell them liberally that they're coming for them in, on loudspeakers. I mean, this is the the day to day that they have to deal with on in Artsakh, and nobody knows this until you're there and you're part of this. And uh, obviously, we live in the United States or America or civilized countries, but in Artsakh, their normal now has become part of a terrorizing daily routine, and. It's, they don't know, there's this uncertainty there. And I feel like uh, as Mariam continues the doc documenting everything, until something really changes there, Azerbaijan will continue to, doing this and they will continue taking territory by territory by territory. for <laughs> Gnatella Irgardenum Ashatumer Tarertankum, U me Tasnihing Metrits, and the other Bejan Sin Kanchela Iran was a lavor ha Ashatir, Morofetev Ashnana et Zar Arten Imakalini, Uyes et Merker Gavert's name. U et Pesa Artsartineri, Sovrakan or et Pesans num Iran's Arorian Ukyanka. And just as a daily, daily day. Uh, routine, uh, the last uh, interviewer that she had, uh, an older woman, she was working on her tree and literally 15 meters away, an Azerbaijani soldier came up to her and said, yes, continue working on that tree because by, by fall, this is going to be my territory and I'm going to be taking the fruits off of it. And this is, this is a daily day what everybody's been dealing with there. Would, would uh, Mariam also please um, speak about the multi-generational effect and connecting perhaps to the genocide as well. Peter, would you? Yes, um, I, I think she understood that. Do you wanna? I know she does. I'm, I, I, we, are, we are listening to the full Armenian because I know many of our audience, many of our audience members understand Armenian and if they're anywhere like me, their hearts grow bigger when they listen to it. So, uh, <laughs> so please, I know, Mariam, that your English is as good as it gets, but I too enjoy it. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Asem inch cup genocide head cup. Tamasin <laughs> O et nuns ragira sharnakelen, shat pat mutunerkan inch pes, uh, tarber curedit, dramartkans, a hapelen, or a selvor inch for a jorov gagan meng enter, inch for one pity canar gang bites bolor dramartkans tarel uspanelen. Et pisi pat mutunka naiav med and tanicum, uh, im papiki, papikner et shamanak, u, uh, naiav artsartineri, greta bolori and tanicum, et pisi pat mutun. Unayev unenk mi im papiki papiki yakpaira 
1920 Եր պարտեն այդ հողը պորել են մեծ բան են սարկել, այդ մարդուն ասել են դու նվակիր, այդ մարդը սկսել են նվակել ու տեսել, որ ադրբեջանցները սպանում են մնացած բոլոր տղամարդ կանց, ու այդ մարդուն ասել են կեզ մենակ չենք սպանելու, որով տեվ դու շատ գեղեցիք ես նվակում, բայց դուքը գնաս բոլոր մարդկանց կասես, որ պիտի իրանք գնան արցախից, որո Yes, the stories basically had continued down from generation to generation. And uh, she recalls, obviously, her, her grandfather and uh, basically grand, grandfather, grandmother stories where uh, one particularly uh, in 1920, where that region, um, people were asked to, they were taken to Shushi uh, at the time by Azerbaijanis and uh, they have told them, tricked them into saying that there's work to be done and they had collected a bunch of young men. And there was one particular one, which ends up being uh, her family friend that uh, lived on through. And he was an exceptional duduk player. A duduk is a Armenian instrument, a uh, wooden flute style, very unique sound. And basically uh, he went with them and as, as they went for this work to be done, uh, the Azerbaijani soldiers had clarified that they needed to uh, create a hole and dig a hole up and everything and as this is going on people start wondering what is this these holes for basically they were they were graves and uh, as uh, the holes were made they asked the duduk player to play uh, and he started playing and as he played the Azerbaijanis started killing the the people one by one tossing them in the holes and the only person that they left behind is the actual duduk player because they told them, oh, we enjoy your music so much and you're such an exceptional player. We'll let you live. But uh, go back and tell your friends and family, this is your future. This is what's going to happen to you. I mean, this is, this is the trauma that continues on till generation to generation. And these stories that have been told from, you know, from one generation to another, and it seems like when uh, the 2020 war erupted, all of that trauma came to surface and everything started coming back to the people there as well. Mm -hmm. Would you take over time-wise, it is your time anyhow. Uh, so maybe Peter, you can continue with your presentation and then we will proceed with Guyanese. Sure, I uh, basically, That's my name- okay, Maria. Is that okay with you? Because we will have more time later. It's just that I would like the audience to be enriched by every presenter. Thank you, dear. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you, Mariam. And thank you for all the hard work you do daily, daily over there. Yes. Um, my name is Peter Balawanian. I was born in Montreal, Canada and raised by Armenian parents. Uh, obviously, my grandparents, uh, both of my grandfathers and one of my grandmother, well, actually, my grandfather and grandmother on my father's side were both orphans uh, and basically were taken to Lebanon, or at least they went to Lebanon. I know my grandfather, when he was six years old, he became an orphan. And then by nine, uh, he actually traveled to Lebanon and started a life there. So I, I can only imagine when I did his history with that uh, a nine-year-old starting a new life without parents in a different country with not knowing the language, how hard it must have been. But I'm here and um, my sister is here. So he, he left the legacy behind. Uh, and, and this is the story of many Armenians that basically dealt with the 1915 war. 
a genocide more than that, more than anything. There was the World War I, but we were the victims of the genocide at that time. The, the war was a perfect cover for the Turks at the time and the Ottoman Empire to decide that the Armenians were a threat. And the, the threat was justified by saying that, oh, eventually these Armenians are gonna probably want more. They're gonna probably wanna have their own land. They're probably helping the Soviets. They're probably, you know, just any reason. And obviously uh, the Pashas at the time that were in control and, you know, they were totally in charge. The Ottomans were, you know, they had, they had conquered a ton of land all over the Middle East as well. And, you know, their armies were strong and mighty. Uh, basically, they, Armenians were, were become slaves in the country. Yes, they, they had positions and they had wealth. They worked hard, but they were used as tools. And when 1915, even before 1915 had erupted the major genocide, there were small genocides uh, all over the area. And Armenians were victims of it. Assyrians were victims of it. Uh, Greeks were victims of it. There was a lot of subnationalities that were victims of it. But then obviously the 1915 came around where the Turks had decided on a major protocol to exterminate uh, all the uh, powerful forms of, you know, that, that were in the Armenians in the communities, such as, you know, uh, heads of churches, uh, priests and mayors, uh, lawyers, anybody that, you know, had education, they took them up, brought them over and killed them. I mean, as simple as that. And then the women and children were basically driven out of, of the land and sent through the desert of, of Syria or uh, outside. This happened, this is a fact, this is the truth. And unfortunately, till today, the, the government of Turkey has never accepted it. Now, the fact that I grew up in Canada with my parents being so strong and Armenian, you know, and putting the um, Armenian culture in me and uh, installing that as I became a young adult, understanding what that is, we, I still had to fight with an identity you know, the identity of what is Armenian, because at the time we didn't have a country. Armenia was still part of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union basically was Russian. So when you identify to somebody that, I'm, that you're Armenian, they would say, what's that? And then you try to explain and then try explaining that you're born in Canada, your parents are born in Lebanon and Armenia is part of the, the USSR. So all of a sudden now, someone is confused as much as you start getting confused and you know all you kind of stick to is the fact that you're Armenian and that's the key word and I think a lot of Armenians had to deal with that as they grew up you know I'm in my early 50s now and as my life went on I saw an independent Armenia and 91 was a big year for all Armenians because what brought the Armenians together outside all over the world the diaspora was the fact that there was objectives for us. One was to have an independent Armenia and two was the recognition of the Armenian genocide. I mean, these two objectives brought every Armenian from anywhere around the world. So if you were from Argentina or if you're from France, you could have differences, upbringings and all that, languages. But the one thing, the two things you did have common were these two things, these two objectives. And every Armenian grew up with that. This was what brought all Armenians together. This is what made Armenians stick into the same path and move forward and unite and fight for justice. And that went on for decades and decades. Uh, the fact that the genocide didn't affect me personally, you would think that it wouldn't affect my day to day, but it was part of my day to day. It was part of my life, part of my upbringing. The fact that uh, I was not a victim personally of the genocide, you would think that I, I would not be a victim, but I was. Unfortunately, as I was growing up, I felt victimized by the fact that it wasn't even accepted in my own country, in Canada, let's say, at the time. I was, I was victimized by the fact that why would, was justice not taken and, and put into place? These were things that, you know, the genocide denied is basically a genocide repeated for a culture. This is the way this continues. And if, and if uh, the justice is not put down and clear and people that are responsible are paid the price for it, we continue this 
being part of that victim you know cycle until you start realizing yourself not to be a victim and mm -hmm. start becoming uh, the strength and the power of uh, not only a survivor but now somebody that basically goes after for justice and then that's the difference that's when the tide changes and in my life at one point the tide changed and when the tide changed uh, I started, you know, doing things on my own. My, uh, luckily, my father was a very active, prominent person in Armenian culture and still is in the community. He started uh, his own record label and produced Armenian music and supported Armenian artists uh, at, at a time where, you know, Armenian music was needed and culture was needed to be installed in the families in the diaspora. And with that, I grew up with, with that in mind. And I grew up with the privilege of being part of... Uh, that culture and it was rich and and powerful for me to have those tools to have you know to, my parents installed in me and it continued on i went to film school and uh one of my first films was about the armenian genocide uh, my third film was about armenian culture and i continued installing it into everything i did it be it's part of who we are we are not as an armenian we could not claim to be armenian and not feel armenian it's it's impossible and to feel Armenian is, is also carrying the burden or even the pain of our ancestors and try to fight and continue the struggle for justice. Uh, till today now, we still continue the struggle. We, even though we're, you know, some Armenians are very prominent. Some people are very popular. As you know, there's some key names in the world that are Armenian. They've been contributing into the world. Even with that, there's still a problem where we still can't get the, the genocide to be recognized completely everywhere. And the fact that there has to be some kind of price to pay for that genocide, the people that were responsible, the denial, the constant denial continues and we continue to fight it. Just recently, the United States accepted it. Biden just recently, yeah. mm -hmm. thank God, announced it last year on April 24th as genocide. I mean, there's organizations in the United States that have been fighting to get that done for for decades if not you know almost a century this is this is where we're at and every time we get to one milestone then there's still a hundred more to try to reach because there's still so much work ahead of us right now i'm i'm honored to be working with mariam she's an incredible filmmaker i found and met her when she started her first one first program first episode she was working for Artsakh tv this was literally right after the war had ended and I was active as well uh, doing other things while the war was going on, but I wanted to make a documentary and I connected with her immediately and I asked her if I would, she wanted a producer. Uh, we spoke very, very, you know, shortly at that time and, uh, you know, the way we connected, I guess, just by mutual goals, you know, we agreed and that was it. That was that was our agreement. And then I've been producing the desire to live ever since uh, from that time on. We, Mariam, I don't know how she did it. She was released, she was going out there, filming people, editing it. And by the next week we were releasing an episode. It was amazing. I mean, I've been working with filmmakers, you know, for 25 years. I never saw raw talent like I saw in her in the situation that she's in. Unbelievable courage. And I, and I said, I'm honored to be her, the producer of this, of this uh, project. Uh, it started off with just episodes and then we have a, the feature film and the feature film basically right now is still doing festivals. There was a means for getting the story out. My, my strengths are that. My strengths are try to spread the awareness as much as I can. Mariam works on protecting the history and the story and my strength is to spread it as far as I can all around the world. I mean, this is how we work together to get to our goal, which is, you know, Artsakh, we need to protect Artsakh. We need to protect the people there. No one's really paying attention. Everything that's happening in this world, the war came and went, very little media coverage. This is what we have a problem with. You know, yes, there's a war in Ukraine. And yes, the war is bad. It has to stop. But if you notice, the minute the war started in Ukraine, the media was all over it because there's something to gain there to stop that war. But in Artsakh, there's nothing to gain to stop the war there. 
there's nothing to gain to call out Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan's rich. They have plenty of money. They got, you know, they have politicians in their pockets. They, they have a, a propaganda machine that's rolling like, like I've never seen before. They're doing everything possible so that they go under the radar and they commit murder and atrocities. And basically they, they committed so many crimes against humanity throughout that 44 day war. Not one person has been held liable yet for it. Uh, obviously we have Guyana on our, on our panel as well. She's an attorney. She'll probably give some examples of things that they've been trying to do and how, how difficult it is. I personally, as a producer, I'm focusing on what my strengths are and my strengths are basically making documentaries, getting them out there and getting people to know. Our festival, uh, our film that right now has been submitted into over 300 festivals. It's already won 118 awards from 58. This is our goal right now. And my goal is to continue spreading awareness. And I'm so glad that the International Center for Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma is working with you on spreading the word and the knowledge and the understanding. Uh, uh, Guyane, would you take us uh, to the justice, difficult justice journey? Please. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Danieli. Uh, such a pleasure, Peter, Mariam, of course, I'm proud to be sharing a space with you. Um, so my background uh, is that I, I grew up in, in Europe um, and, uh, and, in, and in Los Angeles. And so that means I'm in the diaspora and I'm hearing about the Armenian genocide. I'm growing up in it, except that I'm only hearing it from Armenians. And so you know, I, I grew up in a world where the Armenian genocide was not very known. So it's hard to sort of heal from a trauma that is not acknowledged, right? Um, I ended up pursuing a law degree and working uh, in international justice here and there. Um, and I think that's a result of seeing um, justice denied for so long. Um, mm -hmm. And I really wanted to tie together 1915 to what happened in 2020, we are reliving trauma. And that is because in 1915, the Ottoman Turks committed a genocide. And in 2020, Azerbaijan waged a war on a native Armenian population. And the reason that's tied together is because Turkey and Azerbaijan are uh, brother nations. They are both Turkic nations who consider themselves one nation, two states. And Turkey actively provided uh, financial aid in the form of mercenaries from Syria, uh, drones that they built, you know, the latest drone technology, which was used to bomb civilian uh, structures like hospitals, like schools. Um, I've seen it myself, academic institutions. Uh, I went to a conference in, in one of the cities in 2018, and I saw pictures of it in 2020. They had bombed it. It was a hall. It was a hall for academic this course, and it was just bombed to shreds. So this is a continuation in that sense. I just wanted that to be sort of clear. Um, and, and I won't go into the stories that Mariam has documented so well. Um, you know, when the war broke out, there was a deafening silence, which was sort of reminiscent of 1915. 1915, we were lost in like this fog of World War I. And in 2020, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so Azerbaijan took the opportunity and, and invaded. And, um, and so when this happened, the world was largely silent. And Armenians around the world uh, sort of had to take up the legal, their legal arms to defend what was happening. Um, and, this, and, and in a few ways, how they did this was uh, a lot of brilliant lawyers in Armenia, of course, filed appeals to the European Court of Human Rights for um, interim measures. Uh, because there was an imminent risk of irreparable harm to, for example, our churches and other cultural uh, monuments and, and things like that. Uh, there, were, uh, there was, you know, filing in the International Court of Justice, and that was, you know, for uh, regarding the treatment of prisoners of war. Again, the cultural monuments and the religious monuments. Um, and, you know, another interesting facet of that was to combat what we know as armenophobia. Uh, and Armenophobia, and I'll get into that, but that's sort of the hatred 
against Armenians and, and characterizing them as the other. Uh, and so there are legal measures you can take against that. Um, I've personally worked on lawsuits against Turkey for, uh, you know, dealing with indigenous Armenians from Turkey, but also against a drone manufacturer in the U.S. for aiding and abetting uh, genocide in Artsakh because somebody had to sell Turkey the drones that were used by Azerbaijan uh, to bomb these civilians. And, you know, you can be held accountable for that in this country, in the United States, for aiding and abetting genocide in that way. Um, so these are sort of the measures. And I know you and I talked about it a little bit, how none of this actually stopped the hostilities. Um, and I would characterize it almost as triage and, and even deterrence and prevention. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the big picture. Um, and, and I will say, you know, that when we talk about Armenophobia, you know, Armenians didn't just deal with denial and you know, isolation this time around again. Uh, we also dealt with Armenophobia, which is the state of Azerbaijan has engaged for three decades in a campaign of promoting uh, hatred of Armenians uh, as the other in order to sort of prepare their population for a war and to gather support for it. Um, you know, they, their highest official on their social media very openly such as Twitter, made comments about Armenians, uh, you know, referring to them as a problem and unworthy and, and these kind of things. It's also taught in schools. Th these are very well documented. Um, and, and, you know, when you tightly control your media, such as Azerbaijan does, not only are you able to control your population, but what Azerbaijan does is it's controlled sort of the world narrative of what it's been doing. And Peter touched on this where Azerbaijan has, you know, engaged in what has known, has come to be known as the caviar diplomacy, which is they're buying off politicians all over the world with their oil money. Uh, and if you look this up, this coin was termed for exactly the practices put in use by Azerbaijan. Uh, it is not something I am characterizing them as. It's something that's been coined before, you know, this war. Um, and so that makes it easier for them to deter the world from, from sort of stepping in and saying, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't invade a foreign sovereign here, as we've seen done with Ukraine, uh, rightly so. Um, and so, you know, all of this has led to sort of whitewashing of crimes, and it's made it difficult to pursue justice, uh, because if people don't know about it, and then if they know about it, they're hearing a narrative put forth by a um, you know, a state that engages in caviar diplomacy, you have so many obstacles against you. Um, for example, you know, Azerbaijan in its own country built a military trophies park. And so, you know, they, they tout themselves as being a tolerant country, but they built a military trophies park where they uh, display dead Armenian soldiers, 18, 19 year old kids, helmets and belongings. And they, you know, put up these mannequins and, you know, it's open for families to come and, uh, and view. Uh, they've been told to take that down by an international court, of course. So that's, that's good. Um, but I've seen this, these kind of practices are put in use in North Korea. North Korea has a victory museum that does the same thing. They depict American soldiers in a very grotesque way. And their people come and they look at it and they celebrate the victory. Um, and so... You know, that I think in pursuing justice, media and the narrative and this Armenophobia has been a huge part of Armenians in the Armenian fight this time around. There was no Facebook in 1915. Uh, but now, but now we have, even in recent news, uh, there's a recent scandal where a Facebook whistleblower was fired because she uncovered a massive network of fake activity by the Azerbaijani ruling party. So that's how important this narrative is to them. Um, and so there are a number of fake accounts putting out fake information and it's been taken down. Um, and, and still, you know, the world is still not acknowledging anything here. Um, so I think, you know, that, that contributes a lot to our healing because I think a lot of Armenians feel isolated right now and alone again. 
So, you know, I don't like to end things on a very negative note. Um, hostilities are ongoing. There are civilians in danger, as Mariam is documenting. Uh, and, you know, we have POWs that are not returned. And the Armenian border is constantly being encroached upon. Uh, but I will say that, you know, having people document events and, and, and filing these lawsuits in a way, it's, it's healing because you're documenting uh, the events. What happened? Because you, we're not letting people forget. So, uh, you know, in Cambodia, there is a, uh, there's a document. Um, there, it's called DC uh, Document um, Collection of Cambodia, where the statements that are made during the uh, tribunal where they're prosecuting uh, the Khmer Rouge regime, those yes. get gathered, those get documented. I'm glad and you're I think mentioning that's it because Yuk Chang, who is the director of the center and the one who built it and the director is an honorary board member of the ICMGLT. So thank you for mentioning that, go ahead. I, but I think it's so important. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, and I think it was just such a brilliant thing to think about because People who live through that trauma don't always think to document it. They're told to be quiet. But then you have resilient people, which is why I'm so honored to be with people like uh, Mariam and Peter who are standing up and documenting, you know? Um, and I, it's just, uh, it, it's inspiring. And I think it's so important to document these atrocities because it's a lesson learned and it, it doesn't let you forget. And then that way we can heal and not pass on the trauma to our next generation in a way. Um, so, you know, we are a resilient people. We have hope. Uh, we have a lot of smart people around the world that not only are interested in our justice, I think we are interested in justice for a lot of people. Okay. You know, I've worked in many tribunals um, and I think it's so important because at the end of the day, we're, we're a human race and we need to take care of each other. And, and, you know, what happened in 2020, it's just not taking care of each other. I mean, I don't know how else to say that. Um, and so I, I really thank you for having us. And I, I'm honored to speak to your audience, uh, giving us a voice. Thank you so thank you. much. Uh, thank you, Guyane. And uh, Peter and I spoke in the past also uh, that impunity leads to more impunity. And, and that Hitler indeed famously felt emboldened uh, by the world denial and omission of any knowledge of the Armenian genocide. Uh, Peter, you remember we had that conversation. So uh, uh, yes, I agree. Uh, um, very important. I wonder if, with, thank you, Guyane, both for your work and for your spirit. <laughs> you, uh, I do remember that uh, uh, people are different and it's not like on either victim or survivor, right? It's people also move among these different feelings and different positions in life. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, uh, unfortunately, Annie Kalajan is not here. I was, she was registered. But in, uh, in my uh, 1998 book, the International Handbook of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma, there is an, a very important uh, classical chapter by Annie Kalajan and other psychologist experts on the multi-generational effects of the Armenian genocide among other 30 populations around the world. Uh, so uh, it, it's all in our library. Uh, please, you can visit. Also, we are very proud that the library of the ICMGLT contains to my knowledge to date, every published work uh, from the psychological, sociological, and some justice point of view on the multi-generational effects of the Armenian genocide. So please go dig in there. It's, it's an extraordinary resource and we're very proud to 
to have you so well integrated into our work. Uh, I also hope that uh, more maybe doctoral students or further uh, would, um, would translate into Armenian the, the, the gold measure uh, of multi-generational legacies of trauma so we can actually compare and contrast different populations around the world along those lines. Those of you who are interested, please. Uh, we are here 100% of the time. <laughs> so, and, and the measure is on our website. Nothing is secret here. Everything, it, we also don't believe in denial and in hiding. <laughs> it, it's totally out, totally transparent. So we are looking forward to working together uh, further on, on the many layers of the multidisciplinary uh, uh, picture you see even here today. Uh, we are always international and multidisciplinary. I wonder if within you, your own minds, while you were listening to each other, if you have any other um, other thoughts that you would like to add before we open it to the floor? Uh, Mariam, Peter, Kayane? I would, I would uh, say just bef before I, uh, uh, I, I always wanted to tell people if I have a conversation with them is that if you don't hold people responsible for their actions, it continues, it continues in a loop, an endless loop. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be a genocide. It could be anything, right? It could be just someone stealing something. So if, if someone in, in a society does a very small crime and if he's not held you know, liable for it and responsible for it, he'll do it again. This is, this is proven and it's been documented. Now, when it comes down to murder, obviously, uh, if a murderer is not caught, he'll continue killing. And if a government is... Uh, you know, kills massive amounts of people, destroys, uh, tries to erase cultural heritage, and if it's not held responsible, it will happen again. This is the thing that I don't I don't understand is that the governments around the world are, you know, not supporting but not stopping. So when I see that happening, when you're not stopping it and you're not holding people responsible. You're basically telling them they're allowed to do whatever they want. So the, the laws don't apply. When laws don't apply, we see what happens. This is the fear I have. If this doesn't change, there will be an endless loop. You know, and it'll happen to everybody, not just Armenians. Armenians are, uh, you know, maybe fighting for Armenian cause. But I know a ton of Armenians, including me, we fight for justice for anybody because we know how that feels to be taken away, the, the, the justice not put down. So we're fighting because we want justice. We want people to be held responsible, no matter what, whoever they are, if they commit something, they have to be held responsible. And this is the key. And we saw it also with politics in the United States. You know, we went through a whole endless kind of circus, not being held responsible because you're powerful and strong and rich. You know, this world is being controlled by rich and powerful. and Fossil fuel has become a, a form of money and tool to get what you want. Uh, it's a get out of jail card. You know, if you have, I have oil, I can do whatever I want. Here's my card, you know, I'll give you a deal. And this is the problem. We can't, we can't continue like this. Humanity won't continue like this. It, it'll come to a point where we'll just destroy each other and nothing will be left. It, we have to start, start somewhere. We have to hold people responsible. Everybody has to be you know, liable for their actions. Uh, uh, Mariam, do you want to add anything right now? Because we will have a chance for last word from all, each one of you after we open uh, the floor to, to question and answers. Is there anything no. you'd like? Okay, what about you, Bayane? <laughs> I think I spoke enough, um, but I, I agree with what Peter said. Uh, I think it's time to hold re nations responsible. Uh, so uh, let's see, 
everybody is just thanking us. I'm surprised that uh, uh, excellent presentations. You have a lot of compliments, well deserved. Uh, so I'm surprised a little bit. Uh, how about if we use a bit of the hand raising? Uh, Robbie, can we do that? Robbie? We can do that. Can you use the hand raising function? Because I know some of, some of the people in the audience, for example, Howard, Harold Takushian, uh, uh, and Rupin Badalian, uh, I would. It, I was wondering if uh, uh, Harold, uh, beyond just saying great work, friends, if you would like to comment further uh, on what you're hearing, because Harold is one of the most active Armenian psychologists uh, here in in New York. We've I've known him for many years. Harold, <laughs> go ahead. So you say you can ask two questions. Uh, uh, Rabbi, can we do the hand raise? Yep. Wonderful. So Harold, would you raise your hand? Uh, I would. I would very much appreciate uh, your input. And Rupin, you too. <laughs> uh Am I audible? Yes, absolutely. Just briefly, what an excellent set of presentations. Have we any idea how many Azerbaijanis resent what their own nation is doing in Artsakh? We know that there were many good Turks in the 1915 genocide who helped Armenians. Do we have any idea today? Is it just the Turkish leaders or do Azerbaijanis support their own country's warfare? That's a question for any of the panelists. Uh, I, I could give you my, uh, whatever I've documented or at least uh, kind of followed up on. And there's some very interesting uh, documentaries that are become, coming out soon as well, uh, concerning more Azerbaijani and how they conduct themselves. When there are activists in Azerbaijan that have spoken against the Azerbaijani government. I know one in particular that now is, has, left Azerbaijan for his life, went to Turkey, and uh, has been living there, fighting or trying to, you know, tell the truth. Uh, and just recently, he was on Twitter talking about how there was four, um, four people that tried to assassinate him, and they were caught, basically. They were sent from the Azerbaijani government. Now, the problem with, with who's speaking and who's not is the fact that they control, Azerbaijan controls so much of their media and so much of who co comes out, it's tough to know who's actually standing up against them. And at one point, we did see uh, protests in Azerbaijan, small protests, and they were taken down with violence. So they, they, they're met with very harsh consequences in Azerbaijan. So most of them are trying to get out of there before they can actually get killed or get go into prison. That's the sad part about it. I think uh, even though we have social media, now and we can you know come out and say things you know tell whatever we see there's a, a big amount of fear there in azerbaijan but i do believe there are people there that are trying to fight and i do always know and encourage that change comes from within always change comes from within so it can't just come from pressures from outside they, it has to come from within and has to boil out they have to basically you know get aliyev out of that seat i mean he's a dictator that's been whole hogging that seat and holding on to it. And the, the longer he holds on to, just like Putin, the, the more power they have and the less people have hope in the country. And then, and then Guyana had said something also, and we all know it in the Armenian community. 30 years, 1994 was the last war when Armenia ended up, if you want to call it winning, because there's no real winners in wars for me. Everybody ends up losing. But because they had the territory and they had the land of Artsakh controlled within Armenian, Armenian powers, they won. So since 1994, Azerbaijan's goal and plan was implemented. From that point on, they knew that they had to create generations of people that hated Armenians. They saw Armenians as demons, and they do till now. You know, school, the uh, guy I mentioned as well, uh, they're being taught at a very young age. So when there's a five-year-old 
on YouTube is raising his arm and saying death to Armenians, you know, this there's a problem there. And this is where this is why the people themselves see as Armenians as non-human almost or subhuman. And that that is that is very terrifying for people that are living there because now there's no there's no way of actually putting that kind of moral compass in there. You know, that's eliminated when it comes to Armenians. Everybody else, oh, we have a moral compass for. But for Armenians, well, they don't deserve to live because, you know, they're, you know, they're demons. This is very important. And I would like Peter and Harold perhaps to think, and Mariam, to think toward the future, to, have, to plan a webinar on bystanders and resistors. Uh, it, it's it, 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 maybe two different webinars, bystanders and resistors. They are different. Uh, actually, in the, in the book, we also have chapters of multi-generational legacies of resistors, multi-generational legacies of collaborators, multi-generational legacies of perpetrators. So, so we would like to think more in those directions uh, and start your mind uh, rolling about planning uh, at least two more webinars on those aspects. And, and Peter, if in fact you know of such a, such a further uh, a, a documentary coming up, that would be it's excellent. Uh, Harold, you wanted to ask another question, I know. No, let me... Let me leave it at that. I appreciate Yale and Peter, your wonderful effort. This is wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Rupin, are you there? Oh. I met Rupin Badalyan. Uh, well, he was. Uh, in, in 2001, November 2001, you don't know about it because it was right after 9-11, so the news was only about 9-11. But in November of 2001, uh, we held an international uh, conference in Kigali, Rwanda, of all genocide groups. It was uh, the most moving meeting I've ever been to. I had the honor of, of being the international president of it. And Rupin uh, was the first grandchild I met <laughs> who joined us there. Uh, I normally knew more children and <laughs> because of my age, not because of any other reason. Uh, and I know that I, I've been looking for him to be with us today, and I know he joined us. Rupin, are you still here or you had to leave? Okay, he lives now in Switzerland, and at some point he will join us. I was hoping he will join the conversation. I wonder if anyone else has a question, another thought. You, you know everything now? Wow. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me, uh, before we go to uh, before we go to last wor words of the, uh, from our participants, let me announce our future webinar, immediate future webinars. And as you know, we are always planning more. So please, any idea you have that you think is relevant to multi-generational legacies of trauma, we take it very seriously. Now, all of you know, or maybe should know at least, April is Genocide Prevention and Awareness Month. It has been, uh, uh, it is so that uh, uh, April 7 is a commemorative day for the Rwanda genocide, uh, the 17th for Cambodia, the 24 for Armenia, coming up, uh, Yom HaShoah 
for, for the Holocaust. There's something about April. So uh, we already had uh, a, a, okay, let me go future first and then tie it together. Uh, because Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Commemoration Day, occurs on 27 April this year, on May 2nd, Monday at one o'clock Eastern Daytime, we will hold a webinar on the award-winning film Kaddish with Yossi Halevi Klein, the protagonist, Steve Brand, the filmmaker, and Yael Danieli, the chief humanities advisor of the film. The announcement for the webinar will go out as we speak. It will go out today at the end of this event. So I would love for you, all of you to come to that too. The particulars of how to watch the film for a special law rate will be given um, upon registering to the webinar through the midnight of 2nd May. Then, as we have named our last week's webinar, Rwanda won, because it focused on the parental side of post-genocide intergenerational legacies. Our Rwanda 2 webinar, held in collaboration with the Rwanda Foundation, an organization I've been involved with since its inception, will be comprised of and focus on the experience of Rwandan children born after the genocide against the Tutsi. I, I would hope you'd all come. Uh, Rwanda 2 will take place on Monday, May 9 at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there are many more to follow. So uh, please, those who register, you'll remain on our website and uh, on our list of invitees. Oh, Rupin is here. <laughs> Rupin, please say hello. <laughs> I'm so happy. Hello. Do you hear me? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> One yes, of my thanks, favorite uh... people in the whole world. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks uh, for mentioning uh, Rwanda, which was uh, also for me uh, one of the most impressive uh, trips and of course uh, thanks to you uh, I also uh, had a part in that uh, conference uh, at, at that time I was also in uh, Karabakh uh, two three years uh, before that uh, which was also an extremely memorable uh, trip uh, for me at that time um, uh, I also met people who were heavily affected and I was very much touched uh, by uh, this movie uh, of Miriam. Um, it's just so horrible and it's so horrible that um, the world uh, doesn't seem to care. Um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult uh, to take uh, as, a, as a person of Armenian uh, heritage. And uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I think the most important is really to document it, uh, even though uh, <laughs> I'm relatively pessimistic uh, if it will change something in the near future. Um, but at least uh, for future generations, it's extremely important because uh, the denial uh, of the Azerbaijani and the Turkish side will, of course, uh, continue. And so it's extremely important uh, to document at least that so that there is hope, at least that maybe some generations uh, from now a change is possible. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, the only thing uh, I can say now. And thank you very much uh, for this webinar. It's uh, extremely interesting and uh, important. Thanks. Thank you for coming, Rupin. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, Peter and Mariam, the, the, the film works. 
Uh, Mariam should take all the credit for everything that she's done. I'm just facilitating her. Her, <laughs> I really am. I mean, she really is the the person that puts this together and goes out there and puts her neck on. I mean, there's been times where she's been there and you know, gunshot starts and and she still continues. She doesn't stop. Um, I, I would say she's one of the bravest women I've met. And, um, and I hope that God protects her and God protects the people there in Artsakh, basically, so that we can continue doing what we're doing and we can at least try to spread awareness. Um, Rupen is correct. Uh, there is a very, very, very um, small light, but the tunnel is very long. And until we get there, there might be a generation or two, uh, but, you know, and not gonna stop our efforts. At least, you know, Mariam's there every day doing what she does and I'll do what I do to, to try to make a difference. And Guy and May? Um, you know, I, I always just, I hope for a path forward for Armenians because I think we're so resilient that if there's a path forward, we'll take it. Um, and through this webinar, I've come to, think more about, you know, I hope there's a path forward for Azeris in Azerbaijan, because, you know, like the Turks came, a lot of Turkish individuals came to terms with the past. I hope that for the Azeri populations for their own sake, because I feel bad for the minorities that live there that are sent to the front lines to fight Aliyev's war. And, and I'm sure there are more people against the war than we know, but because Azerbaijan is uh, using their pressure on the people and, and, you know, their propaganda machine, they can't voice that opinion. So I, so I hope there's a path forward for healing for both of the populations, mine, you know, Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Um, and I think talking about it is so helpful. So thank you so much for this. Absolutely. Yeah, we we'll continue. There's just no mm. question about that, but that we must continue. And just taking the, not ha just having a voice, assuming somebody gives it to you, but taking a voice, mm. voicing uh, has hope in it among us. And the meeting that Rupin and I remember of Rwanda, I still have a dream that through the center, we will have another such meeting. So victims of all kinds of, of atrocities will come together and we'll share voices and embrace each other. So the voice will become bigger and bigger. Mariam, you're our star. Please take, take time for a few words. <laughs> Ինչպես ասեցիք, որ երբ շատ խոսենք, մեր ձայնը ավելի բարձր կլինը, շատ համաձայն եմ ձեր հետ ու մենակ կասեմ, որ կապչունի ինչքան վատ վիճակում ենք, կապչունի եթե թուրկյան մինչև է սորչի ճանաչել ծեղասպանությու ու միշտ պետք է խոսենք արցախի մասին ու միշտ պահանջենք անկախություն, որով հետև արցախը եղել է հայկական կա ու կլինի ու խոսենք ու երազենք, որ մեր ձայնը ավլի բարձր կլինի ամբողջ աշխարում։ She is basically saying that uh, our voices, when they come together, they get louder. And as they get louder, there's more chance for it to be heard. Uh, she basically will continue the, the fight, the struggle to tell the stories. Uh, she doesn't give up hope. And this is something that I actually love about her and almost every Artsakhti I've ever met is under these circumstances, the hope is there. And as long as you have hope, then there's opportunity for change to come. And I feel that uh, she's basically the typical reason why uh, people should never give up on anything in their lives if they see that the, the truth, with truth, it can set things free. So in this case with her, you know, she's just basically doing what she has to do to tell the truth and then hope that the truth will 
change and bring change to the people of Artsakh, the people of Artsakh that have been there in those lands for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's their land. They don't know anything else. And it doesn't matter who wants to come and bully them out. They'll stand there and they'll they'll stay there. And this is it. This, the resilience of the people is clear. And uh, Artsakh will, within our mind frame, always remain Armenian. And, you know, this is something that uh, will be a, a, a fight for all Armenians all around the world. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Amen to what you said, Peter. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Yal. You are um, a force of your own. And I'm very, very uh, happy I met you uh, in New York. And uh, I'm even more happy that you asked to do this webinar on the Armenian Genocide. Uh, thank you very much for the time that you put in for, you know, doing what you do. And, you know, if we had just a fraction more people like you in the world, I think uh, change would come so much faster. But it, it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. And you are a definitely of high quality. And thank you for what you do for, for every genocide survivor anywhere around the world. Thank you. So, uh, so we continue from now on. Think about the future, the future such events we do. You, you, you moved me very much. Thank you, Peter. So um, we continue. We continue. We continue. We continue. <laughs> We're not stopping. Take care. Perfect. Thank you so much. Have right. you, have, for your, thank you for people that watched. Thank you for the time that you yes, put in. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Take good care, everyone. Stay around. Mariam, you take good care of yourself. We need you. Thank you. Okay, but all of you, Diana, Peter, thank you. It's it's always terribly hard to say goodbye. So, <laughs> so we don't say goodbye. We say in Hebrew we say lehitraot, which means we see you again. I'll see you again. Yes. Thank Tata. you, Doctor Daniel. Lehitraot. <laughs> yes. <laughs>